All right, so tag teaming tonight. The title for the message, uh, What Child Is This? So for those that uh, read through the Parsha, the portion uh, of the Torah that we read every, uh, every week, the Messianic congregation this week is Shemot, which is the uh, first Parsha of Exodus. Exodus in uh, Hebrew is, is called Shemot. Uh, in English, it means the names. Uh, Exodus chapter 1, verse 1 through chapter 6, verse 1. Amen. And so, uh, not uh, not talking too much about that parsha tonight, but we're gonna get right into it. Amen. What child? What child is this? So, of course, we celebrate on this uh, on this night, this day, tomorrow, the birth of of Mashiach, of of Yeshua, our Lord Jesus Christ. And um, maybe it didn't look exactly like this, but it was beautiful nonetheless. Amen. It was very beautiful, very beautiful. So we're just going to read a little bit and uh, just have a thought, really, to share with you all tonight as we, uh, as we celebrate and commemorate this, uh, this event. From Matthew chapter 1, verse 18. Now the birth of Yeshua the Messiah happened this way. When his mother Miriam, or Mary, was engaged to Joseph, but before they came together, uh, they, before they knew each other in marriage, she was found to be pregnant through the Ruach HaKodesh, or the Holy Spirit. And Joseph, her husband, being a righteous man and not wanting to disgrace her publicly, made up his mind to dismiss her secretly. I came across this, and I just felt it on my heart to share tonight, um, just, to, just to pause and think about what this may have felt like for both of these people, uh, really. It's, it's a sweet and a beautiful, powerful day and a night that we celebrate. But for them on both ends, it was arguably quite terrifying. Arguably quite terrifying. <laughs> Joseph being engaged and, and finding out that his, uh, his bride-to-be was with child. And this question, you know, like, like, we can we can uh, we can spiritualize and idealize it. You know they have perfect faith. All of these Bible characters, but really, to think about that in our lives, what that would feel like and what that would do to the relationship, if we were to find that. And you know, like one angel came to me. Well, I don't care if an angel came to you. Where did the baby come from? Where did the baby come? From? Right? Oh man. But it was, it's very interesting in uh, Scripture to read what Joseph did. It's very, uh, it's, very, it's very powerful, him being a righteous man. And I feel like this exchange between the two of them was in a lot of ways a foreshadowing of Messiah's life and a foreshadowing of his purpose and the reason why he came here. It was very easy for Joseph to assume that she was in sin, that she was doing wrong, and According to the law, he was able to have her um, not just disgraced, but, but stoned, killed for, for this. And he had the opportunity to do that. And in his mind, really, at this point, there was nothing more than her word that this uh, was not a sinful act. But instead of taking this, this understanding of sin and using it as an opportunity to destroy her, he chose instead in this being righteous, to extend a mercy and a grace to her that overlooked the fault that, that he maybe saw in her at the time. And I feel like that's so powerful that Messiah was, was raised by an earthly father and an earthly mother that experienced something like this, the need um, in this moment for grace and for mercy to reach beyond the condemnation and the judgment that is so easy to give and that is demanded by the law so that we might have life and a relationship that is beautiful, that is beautiful. And of course, the story uh, does not stop there, but just a couple of passages to share with you. Similar circumstance, but many years later from John chapter 8, and I invite you to, to hear this or read along, but Yeshua went to the Mount of Olives and at dawn he came again into the temple, and all of the people were coming to him, and he sat down and began to teach them. The Torah scholars and Pharisees 
bring in a woman who had been caught in adultery. After putting her in the middle, they say to Yeshua, or Jesus, Teacher, this woman has been caught in the act of committing adultery. In the Torah, in the law, the standard, Moses commanded us to stone such a woman. What do you say? Now they were saying this to trap him so that they would have grounds to accuse him. And some of y'all may have heard this already, but what does it mean uh, to trap him? Well, there were two laws in place at this time, not just the Jewish law, but the Roman law. And so Yeshua was in this spot, for those of you who haven't heard this before, Yeshua was put in this spot where if he was going to honor the law of Moses, he was going to condemn her to death. But in Roman government, it was against their law to do that. And so he would be breaking the Roman law and would be subject to, to civil prosecution or to civil uh, authorities in the land. But if he chose to abide by the Roman law, instead he would be violating the law of Moses, of Torah, and he would essentially uh, break his witness to the Is Israelites as Messiah to the Jews. And so this is their goal. Their goal, you know, and through all throughout Scripture, we find this idea that they were not coming to learn. Their goal was to destroy him. <laughs> Their goal was to destroy him in the eyes of the people. But Yeshua knelt down and started writing in the dirt with his finger. When they kept asking him, he stood up and said, The sinless one among you, let him be the first to throw a stone at her. Then he knelt down again and continued writing on the ground. Now when they heard, they began to leave one by one. The oldest ones first, right? The elders got it. The younger ones, you know, it took a little longer. But eventually they got it, right? Until Yeshua was left alone with the woman in the middle. Straightening up, Yeshua said to her, Woman, where are they? Did no one condemn you? No one, sir, she said. Then neither do I condemn you. But very important, Yeshua said, Go and sin no more. That as beautiful as the message was of mercy and of grace, this Messiah, this God who came, was not just coming to set us free from something, but to set us free unto something as well. Unto a life with God. Unto the Spirit of God, the presence of God, and the life of God that lives inside of us so that we would go and sin no more, not only to be set free, but to embrace the one true source of, of life and all that is truly beautiful and eternal. Amen. And this scripture here, John, I feel like I'm going way too quick. John chapter 3, verse 16. Very familiar, I would imagine. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, but whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. And I just want to focus on these next passages here. We keep on reading. God did not send the son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. The one who believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe has been condemned already because he has not put his trust in the name of the one and only Ben Elohim, or the Son of God. What I really uh, desire to focus on, what I was uh, just thinking about in reading this passage, you know, all throughout the Old Testament, we read about a God who judges and who does what is righteous and what is just. And if that was all that God wanted to continue to do, what would be the point in sending his son? He could judge the world from heaven. He was already doing it for thousands of years. He could continue on to look upon us in our uh, futility as it was to reach the pinnacle of perfection, to reach godliness. And... Uh, We've said it so much before, but I feel like it bears repeating today. It is so unique that God would clothe himself in human flesh. And this is arguably the only place that we read in the history 
of humanity. When God did not create a half God and a half man, but God himself, he came himself. He did not just create a, a Hercules baby that had superpowers, you know, <laughs> right? He came. He got off his throne and he sweat like we sweat. And, and he, he had to use a bathroom just like we have to use a bathroom and shower or else he smelled, you know, and he probably had aches and pains. And he went through so much more pain than that. Amen. For our sake, what kind of a God does that? What kind of a God in such perfection and such eternity of life would give all of that up, would pour himself out, would empty himself of all of that ability and grandeur and, and life to come for our sake and ultimately to be forsaken? That when he was on the cross, he cried out, why, God, have you forsaken me? That he became the very thing that separated us from God. And all of that was in this little baby. <laughs> all of that was in this little baby that God chose to be patient. And God chose to live as we live and to experience what we experience, to hurt as we hurt, to see what it was like to have family members pass away, to live under a government that he may or may not agree with, Amen. To grow up in a theological culture that was maybe missing it the whole time. And he was God himself. But he didn't just burn it all down. Right? <laughs> but his goal was so much more than that. It was so, so beautiful, really. But so powerful and yet so painful. And I feel like the takeaway for us tonight is that we, at the end of the day, were worth all of that to him. And I feel like that's awesome <laughs> to remember, to remember tonight that it was worth it. It was worth all of that just for one soul that would be saved, for me or for you in, in the history of all humanity, that it was worth one soul to give up everything that, that he had, <laughs> to give up everything. That's an awesome present. <laughs> that's an awesome present. I don't mind unwrapping that every year. Right, <laughs> And so he continues. So Joseph, thankfully, thankfully, he caught it, though. And he took this step of faith. And it's interesting that we read this passage after he chose to put her away secretly. After he took that step of faith not to shame her. After he made the decision to show that mercy and that grace. Then he got confirmation after the step of faith that he took. And verse 20, But while he considered these things, behold, an angel of Adonai, or God, appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, the son of David, do not be afraid to take Miriam as your wife, for the child conceived is in her is from the Ruach HaKodesh, the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son, and you shall call his name Yeshua, or Jesus, or literally the salvation of God, for he will save his people from their sins. Not to judge, but to save. To save the people from that which separates them. That it was for the people. That it was for us that he came. It was for us that he came. Not because of our sin, but because of our soul. Of us, of our life. Now all this took place to fulfill what was spoken by Adonai through the prophet, saying, Behold, the virgin shall conceive and give birth to a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. God with us. God chose to live with us. When Joseph woke up from his sleep, he did as the angel of Adonai commanded him and took Miriam, or Mary, as his wife. But he did not know her intimately until she had given birth to his son, and he called his name Yeshua, or Jesus. Amen. 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 And so just just wanted to leave us with an image here. I feel like this is a good illustration, right, of the purpose of this. That try as we might to reach uh, perfection. I remember seeing this painting growing up, and I feel like it's so powerful. Because try as we might to work 
and to make it into his arms. When we finally give up <laughs> our own efforts, and so many times that doesn't come until we have expended every ounce of energy that we have to make it work ourselves. But he's right there to catch us when we finally let ourselves fall into his arms. And I feel like, I feel like that's, that's the message. That's the, that's the Savior that we celebrate. The one who was born, who was a baby, who was so, so powerful, but was willing to take his time to live with the people that he had created. Amen? Amen. Amen. We give God praise. Amen. God is good. God is good. To me, this celebration is about Heavenly Father bringing good news to man. That without Yeshua, without Jesus, we are lost without God and without hope. And of all the people on the planet to celebrate Yeshua, it should be His people. Amen? Hallelujah. <clears throat> Yeshua, Jesus, the prophesied one to come. I want to start with Isaiah 7.14. This is a prophecy. Now, Isaiah wrote the book of Isaiah nearly 700 years before the birth of Jesus. Everybody say 700 years? Is there anybody here 700 years old? Okay. So it's a long, long, long time before Jesus came on the scene. Amen? Therefore, Isaiah 17, 7, 14, therefore the Lord Himself will give you a sign. And we just read this in Matthew. We'll give you a sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call His name Emmanuel. You see, it had to be a virgin to conceive and for Emmanuel to be born. Emmanuel meaning God with us. Everybody say God with us. Listen, you may not know this, but scientifically, a baby receives the father's blood. Not one drop of mama's blood is in that baby. And Yeshua, Jesus, had to be born of a virgin because if he was not, he would have his human father's blood and that blood has been tainted with something called sin since the fall of Adam and Eve. And so he had to have Heavenly Father's blood, which is mind-blowing and amazing that Jesus walking this earth had Heavenly Father's blood, and the blood he shed was that given to him by Heavenly Father. In Luke chapter 1, verse 30-35, through 35, the fulfillment from 700 years prior, and how many of you know our Heavenly Father is always very specific with prophecy as far as Jesus' birth, His death, His resurrection, and His return. He said, hey, uh, guys, a virgin's going to conceive and bear a child. I wonder how many theological arguments for hundreds of years there were about that. Well, how in the world can a virgin conceive and bear a child? I mean, I could hear it now. They probably had 15 different denominations built around that. <clears throat> the first church of, there's no way it can be a virgin. The first church, God didn't really mean a virgin when he said virgin. But how many of you know our Heavenly Father means what he says and says what he means? Amen. And here in Luke 1, 30 through 35, then the angel said to her, said to Mary, do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bring forth a son and shall call his name Jesus, shall call his name Yeshua. He will be great. Everybody say he will be great. He is great and greatly to be praised. Amen. He will be great and will be called the son of the highest. And the Lord God will give him the throne of his father, David. And he will reign over the house of Jacob. How long? And of his kingdom there will be what? These five verses is the entire gospel message right there. It's the start, the middle, and the end. Amen? If you don't know how to share Jesus with somebody, you just read to them Luke 1, 30-35. There's the whole good news right there. I mean, that angel was very concise. Amen? In five verses, summed up to Mary. Mary, you're going to have a son. It's God with us. 
He's going to be the son of the Most High God. Of his kingdom there will be no end. The Lord will give him the throne of his father David. In other words, he's going to be king, he's going to be Messiah, he's going to be Lord, and eventually he's going to rule over all the kingdoms of this earth. Hallelujah, we need it now, amen? Amen. (laughs) Then Mary said to the angel, How can this be, since I do not know a man? And the angel answered and said to her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you. And the power of the highest will overshadow you. Therefore also that Holy One who is to be born will be called the Son of God. I don't have it here, but in the very next verse, Mary gave her consent. She said, be it unto me according to your word. She said, yes, so be it. Amen? In Isaiah chapter 9, and I love this, and I'm going to be closing with these verses here. In Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6 through 7, this is the prophecy. For unto us a child is born. Now, when was Isaiah written? 700 years. Everybody say 700 years. 700 years before the birth of Jesus. For unto us a child is born. Unto us a son is given. It hadn't even happened yet. But how many of you know Heavenly Father is above time and space? And in his mind... He had this all laid out before the foundation of the world. Amen? For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful. Everybody say Wonderful. His name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. His name shall be called Wonderful. Now, I looked up that word, all these words actually in Hebrew, and that word wonderful literally means his name shall be called a miracle, a marvelous thing, amen? It is a miracle that a virgin conceived and brought forth a child who would become our Savior. And this was no coincidence. This was prophesied 700 years before he ever came. There is nothing in your life that's coincidence. Heavenly Father has a plan for it all. And the sooner we come to acknowledge that, and the sooner we come to submit to His plan, His purpose, and His will, the better off our life will be. And the more our life will align with Him. His name shall be called the Mighty God. Everyone say the Mighty God. In Hebrew, that's El Gabor. Mighty, valiant, champion. Warrior, powerful. We don't serve wimpy Jesus. There is no wimpy Jesus, is there, Jason? Where is Jason? There you are in the dark. There is no wimpy Jesus. There is no hippie Jesus, amen? He is warrior, valiant, mighty, champion, powerful, king of kings, lord of lords. He came as a meek lamb the first time, but he's coming as the lion of the tribe of Judah. His name shall be called the Everlasting Father. Everyone say Everlasting Father. This means without beginning, without end. No beginning. Now I know it's hard to wrap our mind. It's hard for me to wrap my mind around the fact that Heavenly Father has no beginning. He not only has no beginning, He has no end. He's outside of time. He's always been and He will always be. And you don't think He knows every intimate detail of your life? And people want to continue to play around with their eternity and play around with their soul with a God who is so holy and yet so loving that He sacrificed His own self. The Word of God became flesh to die on our behalf. His name shall be called the Prince of Peace. Everyone say the Prince of Peace. That word peace in Hebrew is shalom. Have you ever heard shalom before? Somebody asked me, a matter of fact, it was Gary before he moved. He said, Pastor, can you explain to us what shalom means? I know it means more than just peace. Shalom is one of those incredibly beautiful graphic words in Hebrew that has so many tremendous meanings behind it. 
So his name shall be called the Prince of Peace. Prince in Hebrew is Captain, Master, Prince of Shalom. Shalom is safety. How many of you want safety in this life? Safety for your children, safety for your family. Happy. Happy. Somebody said, well, happy doesn't appear in the Bible. No, but shalom is included as part of happiness, joy, friendly. Friend, he's the prince of friendly. I don't know how you picture Jesus, but he's a pretty friendly guy. He puts up with me. He's got to be friendly. Amen. <laughs> he's pretty friendly. Shalom is also health. How many of you need health? Divine health. In this day of sickness and disease and pestilence everywhere, right? Prosperity. Prosperity. Now, I'm not talking about get rich quick ski. I'm talking about prosperity is where you have sufficient in your life to do what God's called you to do. That's prosperity. Amen? Peace. Oh, there's peace. In the midst of shalom, there is peace. How many of you need in the midst of a hurricane or a swelling storm of life, you need peace in the midst of it. I played last Sunday morning for y'all that video of that man at his home in Kentucky as the tornado had taken off his roof and he sat at the piano and he played worship to God. To me, that's the shalom of God. That even in the midst of having lost everything, instead of being bitter, said, Father, I worship You. And begins to worship God. Will we allow Him to be our Prince of Shalom in our life? Welfare, whole being. You see, Jesus isn't interested in just saving one piece of you. He wants to save all of you. He died for all of you. Look at your neighbor and say, He died for all of me. And this is the fulfillment, Luke 2, 8 through 14. And in the same region, there were shepherds out in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were filled with great fear. I mean, hey, if you've been hanging out half your life in the fields watching the sheep, and all of a sudden you see some angels, I mean, you'd be a little fearful too, right? An angel said to them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy. Everybody say great joy. That will be for all the people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior who is Messiah, Moshiach, Christ, Christos, the Lord. And this will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped in swaddling clothes and lying in a manger. Now, I love that. This was the first celebration of the birth of Yeshua. And it was done by angels. And angels didn't even benefit from the birth, death, and resurrection of the Savior. Only man has benefited from that. And yet they still celebrate it because of the good news for us. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying, Glory to God. Say this with me. Glory to God in the highest. And on earth, peace among those with whom He is pleased. How many of you want Him to be pleased with you? And on earth, shalom among those with whom He is pleased. Who is He pleased with? How do you join His story? You surrender your life to the Lord Jesus and make Jesus Lord of every area of your life. The Bible says in Romans 10.9, because if you confess, if you speak out with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, and you believe in your heart that God has raised Jesus from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes and is justified, and with the mouth one confesses and is saved. Stand with me if you would. <clears throat> Pastor Brian, Miss Karen, John and Claudia. Every head bowed, every eye closed. Father, we bless you. We love you tonight. We thank you, Heavenly Father, that we get to rejoice with all the hosts of heaven and with all the multitudes of those around the globe 
because Messiah, our Savior, has been born and has come and sacrificed Himself for the sins of the entire world. But there are some here tonight. You've not yet given your life to Jesus. You're not sure if you were to die today that you'd have a place in heaven, but you can be sure. You realize that you want to be a part of His story. He says it's peace to those whom He is well pleased with. And whom is He well pleased with? But to those who have surrendered their life to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. Tonight's your night. It's no accident you're here. This is a part of Heavenly Father's plan for your life. If you'll submit to it and yield to it, He will change your life forever from this night forward.